You know, for our last little uh, piece of news, um, this isn't really new news. Um, you might you might have noticed the uh, the video of the two Arizona State uh, students, the two girls who kicked out two other male students because of, from a multicultural center because of the color of their skin. I put up the video earlier this week. You probably saw it. Here's a quick snippet of it. You're making this space you uncomfortable. Me uncomfortable. But you're white. Do you understand what a multicultural space? It means you're not being centered. This white man thinks he can take up our space. And this is why we need a multicultural space. Because they think they can get away with this shit. You know, like I said, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest with you. You know, the situation calls for it. I have... I'm really tired of talking about race first and foremost, and it feels like I've been doing a lot about that since since covering, yeah, since since starting the show. Um, but it goes beyond that. It goes beyond just being tired of it. You know, I just, you you know, I I wrote I wrote this book, Rockers Creek. You know, I, I joke about it sometimes. You know, but there's there's like about a hundred thousand words in this book, and I can't think of any that really just sum up just how unbelievably disheartening it is and how much it, it rips me up inside to look back on the first half of my life, right? The, about the first 16 years or so and look back on it all nostalgically. Not, not because I'm like longing for my youth or anything. I'm, I'm only 25 years old. You know, I'm, I'm still plenty young. But to look back on it nostalgically simply because Race never factored in to any of it. You know, I mean, I, I went to public school. I went to the Boys and Girls Club after school. I, I went to summer camp. You know, I, and I met and was friends with, with people from, from all walks of life, right? I had white friends. I had Hispanic friends. I had black friends. I had a couple Middle Eastern friends and Asian friends, right? I, I, met, I met kids who were, who were Catholics, who were Baptists, who were agnostics, who were atheists, who were, who were Muslims, right? But none of that mattered. You know, I, I think about middle school and showing up before class every single day and getting down on the soccer field and, and meeting up with the guys to play football before school started. And, you know, when you get on that field, it was never like, oh, there's my Hispanic friend. Oh, there's my black friend. Oh, the, you know, there's there's my Muslim friend, my, my Middle Eastern friend. No, no, no. It was just, there's Isaiah. There's Sean, there's Felix, there's Keegan, there's, there's, there's the guys, you know? And that was right. It was the way the world was supposed to be. And you know, I can't, and to look back on all that nostalgically and, and to, to look back on these, these last few years and, and to get to watch society get twisted into this, this, this freaking this freaking voice that just shouts at you and beats you down and batters you and, and, and forces you to look back on all of that and to admit and to acknowledge that it was all a lie. That it was all a lie. That to everyone on that damn field, that everyone on that damn soccer field in the mornings, that for everyone there, it was color first. And that if you didn't see that, it was because you were the bad guy. It's because you were the monster and you were hurting those people. You are hurting your friends. I, 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 yeah, I, I, I can't describe just how much it tears me up inside to, to see videos like that and to see society get twisted into this thing and to look back on it all and recognize that, that growing up, we all took it for granted. Right? It was the way the world was supposed to be. It was right, but we took it for granted. And I'll be honest, we took it for granted because we didn't think it was something that you could take for granted. We didn't think it was something that we could lose. Here we are. Here we are. All right? People getting kicked out of buildings because of the color of their skin all over again. It's just like Rosa Parks. It's just like the freaking 60s. And these are... The Jim Crow members, the, the new members of Jim Crow, hands down. This is what we're headed for. And it kills me. It kills me to feel like, like everything, that everything that I've known all my life, to feel, to feel like the world is telling me that it was all bullshit.
that none of it was real. And I know that it was. I know it was right. And I know it was the way the world was supposed to be. And I didn't think it was something that I could lose. And I didn't think it was something that my kids could lose before they were even born. You know, it makes me wonder what else we could lose that we didn't think we could lose. What other freedoms could we, could we, could we lose that we didn't think we could take for granted? The reality is all of them, all of them, are up for grabs. Unless we do something about it. And you know, I, I've talked about, I've talked about the need to resist, the need to speak up, the, 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 the need to get involved in the, in the fight for all of us to do our part together. I've talked about that a lot. Um, but you know, I was, I was kind of browsing YouTube the other day and the suggested videos list was a, was a speech I hadn't seen in a while. But you, you might remember from last week, I had mentioned that Charlton Heston was somebody who I greatly admired. And he gave, in 1999, 20 years, 20 years ago, he gave perhaps, I think, one of the, the single greatest speeches in modern American history. In 1999, he saw what was coming, and he predicted it, and he was right. He was right on the nose. But he also talked about how to fight back against that, how to resist, what you needed to do. And I know in my heart that he was right about that, too. We posted the speech this week, and if you get the chance to check out the full thing, I highly encourage you to do so. Um... But since I can't, since I can't think of the words, really, um, I just wanted to end today's episode with Charlton Heston giving you the words for me about what you need to do if you want your kids to have what they don't have today, what society is stripping from them before they're even born, and what it's taking from you today. I want you to just ponder on that a little bit, to ponder on these, to ponder on these words, and to know that, uh, to know that I still believe. I still believe in hope, and I still believe that we can come back and that we can win this thing, but it's going to take all of us. So here it is. But what can you do? How can anyone prevail against such pervasive social subjugation? Well, the answer's been here all along. I learned it 36 years ago on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., standing with Dr. Martin Luther King and 200,000 people. You simply disobey, peaceably, yes, Respectfully, of course. Non-violently, absolutely. But when told how to think or what to say or how to behave, we don't. We disobey. Social protocol that stifles and stigmatizes personal freedom. I learned the awesome power of disobedience from Dr. King, who learned it from Gandhi and Thoreau and Jesus and every other great man who led those in the right against those with the might. Disobedience is in our DNA. We feel innate kinship with that disobedient spirit that tossed tea into Boston Harbor. It sent Thoreau to jail. It refused to sit in the back of the bus that protested the war in Vietnam. In that same spirit, I'm asking you to disavow cultural correctness with massive disobedience of rogue authority, social directives, and onerous laws that weaken personal freedom. But be careful, it hurts. Disobedience demands that you put yourself at risk. Dr. King stood in lots of balconies. You must be willing to be humiliated, to endure the modern-day equivalent of the police dogs in Montgomery and the water cannons at Selma. You must be willing to experience discomfort. Now, I'm not complaining, but 
My own decades of social activism have left their mark on me. I'll never be offered another film by Warner Brothers or get a good review from Time magazine, but disobedience means you have to be willing to act, not just talk. When a mugger sues his elderly victim for defending herself, jam the switchboard at the district attorney's office. When your university is pressured, your university is pressured to lower standards until 80% of the students graduate with honors, choke the halls of the Board of Regents. When an eight-year-old boy pecks a girl's cheek in the playground and then gets called into court for sexual harassment, march on that school and block its doorways. When someone you elected is seduced by political power and betrays you, Petition them, oust them, banish them. When Time Magazine's cover portrays millennium nuts as deranged, crazy Christians holding a cross, as it did last month, boycott their magazine and the products it advertises. So that this nation may long endure, I urge you to follow in the hallowed footsteps of the great disobediences of history, that freed exiles, founded religions, defeated tyrants, and yes, in the hands of an aroused rabble in arms and a few great men, by God's grace, built this country. If Dr. King were here, I think he would agree. I thank you.